Good afternoon and welcome, boys and girls, wherever you might be in the world. Welcome to the Mara Triangle in Kenya, where it is a very nice 30 degrees Celsius, 86 degrees Fahrenheit. And we are with some beautiful elephants. And when I say we, I talk about myself. My name is Steve and Big James is on camera. And welcome to the show once again. And if you have any questions, please speak to your parents or guardians. Send through an email to natgeokids at wildearth.tv. We'd love to hear from you. Send through those questions or comments and let's see what we can help you with this afternoon. But here we have got the beautiful family of African elephants. And I wonder if you know why I call them African elephants, because there are two species of elephant, well, two commonly known species of elephant, being the African elephant, which obviously occurs in Africa, and the Indian elephant, which, well, occurs in India, which is a continent a little bit further east into Asia than where we are. And the African elephant is much bigger, much bigger ears, much bigger animal, and the, the body structure and shape is slightly different as well but on the tip of the trunk one of the easiest and the most characteristic differences on the tip of the trunk because the trunk uses the there's a vehicle in the background there we're not the only ones moving around in the Mara Triangle it is an enormous conservation area with lots of animals for people to come and see and you see how she's using the, her trunk to pick up the grasses and if you look at the tip of her trunk, there are actually two fingers at the end there that she uses for peeling and grabbing and breaking things. She's using her foot as well, whereas the Indian elephant has only got one finger. So that's one of the easy or different differences between the two. But uh, you will come back to us shortly with our elephants. I'm not the only one out on drive this afternoon. My good friend David is just around the corner and he's got another very tall animal. Hello boys and girls of Nat Geo and welcome to my giraffes. You just saw some big animals which Steve I'm sure told you are the largest mammals on land and I am showing you now the tallest animals in the world and these are called the Maasai giraffe. My name is David and on camera with me today is Bungay. Bungay, good afternoon. Please, boys and girls, remember, your questions will make us very happy. Using your parents or your guardians, tell them to send us emails. Not your kids at wildearth.tv is the email address to send your questions or your comments. How exciting to see giraffes just walking together. And to me, those looks like two boys, two boys, because if you look on top of their horns, that sometimes we call ossicons, they are a bit flat. They are a bit flat because boys sometimes tend to fight with each other and by so doing, they get rough or they are bold on the top of their horns. But the girls, like the one you see to the left, they are eating. If you look carefully on top of her horns, there's some like tufts of fur or hair that is still growing. That's how, from a distance, you can tell a boy from a girl. Giraffes are animals that will only eat leaves, or we would call them herbivores, just like the elephants. But there's one difference between the elephant you saw and the giraffes. Giraffes will only eat small leaves, or small branches, or small twigs. But elephants will eat all that including the grass. So what I'm saying here is giraffes will not eat grass. Look at that one. So that giraffe just standing up and saying hello to all of you boys and girls. And I want now to take you all the way to South Africa to see another gentleman who will say hello to all of you. Good afternoon everybody and welcome to the Western Kruger National Park of South Africa, the world's most beautiful country. A close second of course is Kenya and the rest of the world comes a... See, the elephant is just agreeing with me. 
My name is James Hendry. It's lovely to have you with us. Please talk to us, of course, or ask your parents to talk to us using the email address questions. What's the email address again? It is uh, natgeokids at wildearth.tv. That's natgeokids at wildearth.tv. It's just because I'm so old that I forgot what was going on. Here we have the elephants, and you will see that what they've done is take all the shade. So we having to sit here in the sun, and it's about 34 degrees Celsius here, I think. I've forgotten exactly what the temperature is, but probably between 34 and 35 degrees Celsius or so, which puts us around, oh, good grief. It's 38 degrees Celsius here, 100 degrees Fahrenheit, if you can believe it. So it's very, very hot indeed. And the elephants have got the shade, and that very, very, well, what shall we say, very beautiful little elephant has in fact decided that it needs some milk. That's what it was doing there, it was suckling. So nursing from its mother, and that shout you heard, I think was the mother getting angry with a youngster that's just off to the left-hand side. You can see that one standing in the sun there, and I think the only reason that one's standing in the sun is that the cow, that's what we call the adult females, had a go at him. Probably because he was bullying her little one. They don't stand for that, the mothers. Now you will see them flapping their ears, flapping, 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 and that is trying to stay cool. That helps them to stay cool. There's a lot of blood that flows through the ears there and it goes straight into the brain and keeps the brain cool. So all of the blood in an elephant's body can flow through its ears in about 20 minutes. And so they flap them, flap them, flap them, you can see there. And that cools the blood and that goes to the brain and that helps them stay nice and cool. Because elephants can't sweat. They can sweat a little bit, but not much. And so they need other ways of staying cool. One of the other reasons, or one of the other ways that they stay cool, is with their wrinkly skin. That helps them to stay cool because what it does, and this is quite a difficult concept, but I'll try and explain it to you, it increases the surface area. All that means, basically, is that because they've got wrinkly skin, they'll heat up more slowly than an animal that has got smooth skin. And interestingly also, their skin is not waterproof. Tom, yes, you say lots of energy, but the energy is mainly being expended trying to stay cool. And you'll find that elephants like this will try and stay as calm as possible. All animals, in fact, in sun and heat like this will try and stay as calm as possible because the more they move around, the more active they are, the more they do things, the hotter they'll get. And I'm sure you'll find this lot going towards some water sometime during the course of the afternoon. That throwing of the sand on the body is also helpful. Helps the elephants to stay a bit cool. Big, you say, is this real-time live? Well, yes, it is real-time live. I promise you it is real-time live. From two locations, not just one. We are here in the Western Kruger of South Africa. And David Gatamba Gitu and Steve the Vov is up in the Masai Mara. And in fact, there are two herds of elephants here. This is quite a small one. There's a bigger one gathered under that big shady marula tree over there. And you can see them flapping their ears together as well. See? Flappity flap flap. There's a tiny little one there. That's probably only about a year old, maybe a little bit less even. See them all flapping their ears. Now I suspect a little bit like human beings, you will find that they get used to the heat after a little while. I know that for me, and for a lot of my friends who work out here, 
The first month of heat after the winter is very difficult to deal with. We find it quite tough to move around. We find it oppressive, which means we sweat a lot and we just feel tired all the time. But after a month or two, you kind of get used to it. And I think that's the same for the elephants. So we're into the kind of really hot parts of the year now. We haven't had a lot of rain, and so it really does feel quite hot and dry. And I think that's why you'll find these elephants quite desperately flapping their ears like that, trying to stay cool. There's not a lot of shade around because we haven't had a lot of rain and that means that the trees don't have a huge number of leaves on them yet. Zane, interestingly, is a really good question, but interestingly a, an elephant actually doesn't really ever stop growing and so it, you can't really answer the question how long does it take for a baby elephant to become a fully grown adult elephant because, well, they're adult I suppose for the cows you could say at around about 13 or 14 years old because they are ready to have babies by then. But they'll keep growing and the bulls especially will keep growing and almost until the day they die. As long as they can eat and get enough food they'll keep growing. Alrighty, we're going to move away from here simply because it is too hot for us to be here, but David Gatamba Getu up in the Masai Mara has got a lovely sighting for you. Good boys and girls, how lucky you're seeing now elephants for the second time. And I thought I am not going to leave my giraffes and I'll hang around here so that we could see maybe three, four, five together. Now, the one you see on the far left, if Bungay, you see the one eating on the far left there? Look at how young she is. It's not an adult, but that's a baby growing, and they will always stay together in a herd and not just alone. And for the reason to stay together is for safety. See how majestic they walk? And apart from being the tallest animals, giraffes also have the longest necks of all the animals in the world. This particular type of giraffe is called the Maasai giraffe. And we've got different types of giraffes in the world. Now, this one that I saw from a distance sitting down, and I want Bungay to go there and show you, when they sit down, they don't lie down, they remain with their heads upright, very good. Somewhere there. You see that one there? Very good. There's one just sitting down, which is quite unusual for her to be very good. You see how she sits down? Now, in that position, I'll tell you that giraffe, the neck only, is taller than all of you. They have the tallest necks, they have the tallest legs, and also they happen to have very long tongues. You just saw the tongue come out for a few seconds and then she quickly put it back in her mouth. When they have eaten so much, they'll just sit there and rest. You see the tongue again? A giraffe tongue could be almost 18 inches, you can imagine, almost going close to two feet long. And the reason for that, they need to reach some leaves that are quite far from the bushes they're feeding on. I think she decided just to lay down there and hide her head from you guys. The animals in Africa are grouped. For example, the giraffes, we give them group names. And giraffes together, we would call them a herd of giraffes. But this particular one, see, instead of saying a herd of giraffes, you can say a tower of giraffes because they're very tall animals. They are the only animals that are lucky to eat the trees that are very tall that other animals cannot reach. So I was counting here, we have about seven giraffes together. Now the one close to your screen, if you look carefully, she is a bit lighter. And the reason for that is because she is also a bit young. When they get sometimes exposed to the sun for so long, the color might change slightly and also as they get older. Look at her horns, she look small, or the horns also look small. And she's staying not very far from the mother. The 
Giraffe girl, always a pleasure to hear your name. And yes, the giraffes will not have their heads for too long because for the heart to be able to pump the blood all the way to the head is quite a challenge. So you will notice every few minutes, maybe after two, three minutes, they swing the head up just to make sure the pressure remains fine and balanced. Otherwise, what will happen is if there's so much pressure going to the head, that definitely will not be good for the giraffe. There's a kneeland right below the neck of that giraffe you see there. There's another animal that just flicking at his tail and we call it just disappeared and we call it an eland and Bungay is trying to go close to her and he's just staying in the midst of the giraffes, the eland. Giraffes are some of the animals that have the largest hearts and I think if I remember very well their hearts would weigh up to 30 kilograms or 60 pounds. And they need such big hearts to be able to pump blood all over the body without having issues of getting or being under pressure. Now I will leave the giraffes feeding here and we'll go across to Steve who have something interesting to Thank you David. Well we're caught in a little bit of a traffic jam on the road here. The elephants are, well, they're not looking at it at a road and saying, let's stop the cars coming through. They're just moving through the landscape, feeding on the beautifully luscious green grass that we have up here in the Mara. Unlike down in South Africa, we've had lots of rain in these areas. And there's more rain coming. South Africa's been waiting for rain all season, just coming out of the... The dry season, the wet season is upon them down there, but um, it is time of plenty up here in the Mara as the elephants are absolutely loving feeding on everything on the ground with their long two-fingered nose. They're able to grab and catch anything they want. Vegetarians they are feeding on small little forbs, little green plants and grasses, moving as one family constantly eating they reckon that a big male elephant needs to feed on about 600 pounds of food a day obviously the younger ones feed on a lot less but that is a lot of food which means that all day long that nose is grabbing and putting in the mouth grabbing and putting in the mouth they don't have time to rest constantly eating you might have seen that giraffe sitting down. Well, when they're sitting down, they've got a very different digestive system and they're able to rest because they've filled their belly with leaves. The giraffe has, and then they re, sort of rechew and rechew to get maximum out of the food they've eaten. But elephants have got very badly designed sort of teeth and a digestive system that is designed for dealing with huge amounts of food. Not about quality, it's all about quantity when you're an elephant. And you can see it's picking up a little creeper-like forb that's growing on the ground. They're smelling them in the long grass. They've got very good sense of smell. Like when you walk through the candy store, you know exactly which sweet you're looking for. You could probably close your eyes and find the sweets that you like the most. Rosalind, you want to know how elephants' trunks evolved? Well, when you look at this elephant here, imagine this elephant being about 50 to 75 times smaller. So being maybe the size of a large dog. And uh, they would have lived in a forest size, a forest area where they were feeding with their mouth, just like most other antelope you see feeding. They would have just put their mouth on the branches and fed that way. But the climate changed. And the climate changed, which means we got less rainfall. And the areas opened up and we, what was created was the savanna ecosystem that you see now. The savanna is with trees and lots of grasses. So what it allowed for was for animals to get much, much bigger because there was a lot more food available. There's not a lot of food actually available in a forest, if you believe it or not. But out here on the grasslands, there's lots of food available. So the elephants got bigger and as they got bigger, their head got bigger 
well. So they needed these really big pillar-like legs to keep their body weight up. And so their neck got shorter to hold their big head. And as they got bigger and more heavy with long, powerful pillar-like legs and almost no neck, it became very, very difficult for them to reach any sort of vegetation. So their nose got longer and longer and longer. It's a very long process that happened, evolutionary process but the elephant is probably one of those most evolved animals that we have. The only one, really, with a nose that's able to do what it does. They drink with the nose by sucking it up the water like a straw, and they pour it into the back of their mouth. They caress each other. They pull branches down. They can pick up fruits. They can help their youngsters if they fall down. And they can pick anything up off the ground and rip bark off of trees. Pachyderm, what a lovely name. You want to know if elephants like fruit of any kind. Elephants love fruit. Absolutely love it. Just like we do. Elephants actually go a little bit crazy for fruit. Out here in the African wilds, there is a lot of fruit, but not the same sort of fruit that we get today. The fruit that we get on our shelves, we've modified and sort of messed with over a very long period of time. But there are lots and lots of plants out here that provide fruit. South Africa as well, I'm sure James will be able to tell you. There's some trees there called the marula tree, which I'm sure is showing some flowers at the moment. Elephants go absolutely absolutely crazy for those fruits and there's a place down in the south of South Africa called Addo Elephant National Park and down there around that national park they used to and they still do they harvest and farm lots and lots of oranges and the problem is is they used to feed the elephants oranges around the reserve and now it is against the law to take oranges into that reserve because if you do the elephants will actually break open your car to get at those oranges which is a real big problem so they do love fruit and they can actually peel an orange with those two fingers on their trunk well I hope you enjoyed that little bit from these Ellie's so we're going to move on and see what else we can find and in the meantime we're going to jump back over to David all right boys and girls we'll have a bit of a change of seeing so many big animals and now let us look at an animal that got feathers and we got an eagle for you here and I'm sure you know you got the American the bald eagle now this one to me I guess is the steppe eagle and either she got something she's feeding on there on the ground or she's just waiting for us maybe to move and she'll continue feeding I do not know exactly what she's doing there but what these eagles will do if for example lions you know make a kill and have some food say an impala or an antelope and then they leave it behind these eagles will come and leave and eat what's left behind by the lions that's called carrion there's something in front of it there I don't know what it is to me it looks like some poo of an elephant but I think she has been trying to open it up all these elephants who have been showing you when they eat their food they do not digest their food very well and sometimes in the process of eating their food they also swallow some insects and sometimes these insects go through the mouth and come out alive how funny is that kids eh? and if that happens an ego like this is going to open that poo of an elephant and eat those insects they could be beetles they could be some worms and I would guess that's exactly maybe what she is doing with elephant poo in front of her. Remember, boys and girls, to keep asking us questions through your parents using NatGeoKids at Waldath.tv. Terry, how tall is a fully grown elephant? We'll be showing you one, Terry. You'd like to know how tall they get. But I would say they could be anything about three meters. Three meters, which would translate to almost ten feet. And that's the tallest elephant you might see. That's a fully grown one. And Terry, I hope now you see another bird there. And this one is called a lapwing. It's called a watered lapwing. Just listen to her.
And I hope you can hear that, boys and girls. And she is trying to call the one on the left. You see there are two of them? And lapwings, thank you very much. And lapwings will always stay near water. Most lapwings love water because that's where they get their food. Look at their feet, they are quite long. And that would help them to walk through the water as they look for food or also on the edge of the water. All right, let's go across quickly to South Africa because James have an interesting animal. Look what we found here. Now, I said to our camera operator this afternoon, whose name is Senzo, I said to him, I'm sure there'll be a cat in the shade here. And I looked around here and I didn't see anything. And then he said to me, as we pulled away from the dam, he said, there's your leopard in the shade over there. I thought he was joking, but there she is. Isn't that great? That's magnificent. Now this is a very special leopard. Her name is Tandi, and she is the queen of Juma. She's nearly 13, which is pretty old for a female leopard. And you see she's got a bit of an injury. She obviously had a fight a little while back. But it seems that she's had that for a while and she's actually okay. She's not too badly injured. And you know these leopards, even though it's very dangerous for them to get injured, simply because if they do get injured, it's quite likely that they won't be able to hunt. Even though that is the case, they do scavenge, which means they can steal some food from others. And so she probably would have been stealing some food, and that's why she's still alive. Isn't that amazing? Very nice picture there of a leopard having a drink. And a lot of you probably have met her before and saying how beautiful she is, even though she has an injury. Yes, but I've never met anybody who said that, that, that there's an ugly leopard. <laughs> she does look a little bit thin, so I hope she is eating. I'm just quickly going to call this in on the radio stations. Tandy is at Buffles Hook Dam, if anyone's interested. That means that I'm just telling the other game drives in the area that this leopard is here. Now, I don't know what injured this cat, but I think that it looks to me like it was another cat. It looks to me like there was a big slice on the back there, and I think that could only have been made by the claws of another cat may have been the teeth of a hyena, but it looks like a knife wound almost. And the only thing that will make a knife wound is the claws of another cat. So I don't know who she had a fight with, but it was obviously a very bad fight. No, Sky, there's no sign that she took something down. There's certainly a sign that she's had something to eat simply because she doesn't look that hungry. She does look a bit hungry. She could certainly eat some more. But you know, these leopards are amazing because they can catch just about anything. They can catch birds. They'll eat insects if they have to. She'll eat frogs and terrapins and all sorts of other things. That's why these birds you can hear are going tink, 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 tink. They are alarm calling at our queen. Isn't she lovely? And she doesn't mind this dirty, muddy water. And in fact, if you look at her at that angle, if you look at her uninjured side, she actually looks pretty good. You'll notice a leopard starts to look like they're in trouble or like they're not healthy when their hips start to show. And her hips are not showing. 
Her hips are fine. She is swollen where the cut is on her belly. She's definitely a little bit swollen there. And that means that there's probably some sort of infection. But this, this wound is now a few weeks old, I think. At least a week old. Now, a number of our viewers who watch this show often apparently are convinced that this was inflicted, that the injuries, injuries were inflicted by a leopard called Sibui, and there are in fact reports that she had a fight with a leopard called Sibui, and so that's probably exactly what happened. Tandi is quite aggressive with other leopards. She, many leopards will not actually engage physically with each other, they just growl at each other and on territorial boundaries, but Tandi is not afraid to go in and have a sort of attack, if you like, and I suspect that's got her into trouble this time round. But I think she'll be okay. I don't think she's going to die. Well, we hope. She looks all right to me. See, she's looking around all the time. Looks like she's a little bit worried. I'm just going to get my head out of the way as she goes past. And I'm just going to sit very still. Because this leopard is now very close to us. Beautiful. Yeah, I got a good look there. She could definitely eat. She's not smelling too good. That's actually interesting. That that didn't smell nice as she walked past. I smelled a bit of a either a smell of dung or something like that. Hmm. Paula, the birds are chirping. What do you got? Okay, sorry about that. We just had to uh, change something on the camera. Um, the reason the birds are calling is because they're alarm calling at her. They think she might pose a danger to them. And so they're warning each other to stay away from her. Okay, let's try and keep up with Tandi. She's disappeared almost immediately. There she goes. All right, well, we'll keep following him. And apparently the Vov up in the Masai Mara has managed to find some of their beautiful birds. We do have some birds. Sorry about me moving there. Not just some birds, but they are juvenile saddle-built storks, which to me are one of the coolest things ever. First time I've ever seen them was a month ago in the same area here with the adult. The adult is just in... Oh, the adult's there still. Oh, the adult has moved. Not sure where it's gone, but there are three chicks and they are very cool to see. To the right of the three chicks, you can see the white stork there is busy doing a bit of a, a wing dancing sort of maneuver. That's a yellow-billed stork. It's kind of doing some shady sort of stuff. It's really hard to understand. They normally do that over water, a sort of a balancing act, so that they can sort of lift one leg up and also so they can provide some shade for birds, or not birds, for fish to swim underneath. The saddlebilled stork, though, what's interesting is that three chicks there, or youngsters, that were hanging out the, uh, with the adults. I'm not sure where the adult disappeared to, but they were flapping their wings and begging for food. Even though they're able to walk around and fly themselves, they are still begging for food at the moment. And actually, what's interesting is normally they only have successfully about one chick every single year. So these have got three, and they're looking in very, very good condition. And seeing them a month ago for the first time and now again makes me very, very happy. Because in South Africa, they're regarded as endangered. They reckon there's only 60 species, uh, 60 nests in the whole of South Africa, which is a very low number. But up here in Kenya, I don't think they're as threatened. 
But very nice to see. Did you see where the adult went to, James? He's gone, eh? Lots of birds. I think the adult flew away because the chicks were giving him a hard time. He was trying to to maybe catch them some food or maybe just to hang out with them, do a little bit of father-son time. And all they could do was beg, give me food, give me food, give me food. So he decided, well, I'm out of here. I left them to hang out in the open with the yellow-billed stalk. And now it looks like they are going to sit down on the ground. There's another bird behind there called a spur-winged lapwing, just behind that stalk on the left. And it's looking for all sorts of insects on the floor. They're all looking for insects. The large birds obviously will feed on fish. Well, that one wants to go for a rock. Isn't that interesting? It's probably still learning. Well, look what I can do with my beak. There might be something hiding underneath the rock. They would feed on frogs and lizards, crabs, any fish they can catch. But I was hoping the adult would be here for you so you could see. But I'll have to show you a picture because they are probably the prettiest stork. That is an Egyptian goose in the front there. Probably the nastiest sound in the African wilderness. <laughs> One of the nastiest sounds, in fact. Okay, well, here, James, I've got a nice photo in the front here. So here is a picture of the adult. Hopefully you can see it. It's got some beautiful colors. And the name saddle build is because if you look at the beak, the beak is red with that, that black line and then that yellow on the top, which almost looks like a saddle, doesn't it? Stood Hart, you want to know when the chicks will leave? Well, they've left the nest, but they can stay in the sort of range of the parents for a good year or two now before moving off, before going off and finding a mate. It takes them, because they're quite a large bird, it takes them a little bit longer to develop, so about two years or so they'll move off and go find a mate for themselves, and then we'll find a nest and then continue the process of the circle of life. So that's very interesting. We're going to move on. I'm very excited to have been able to find and show you these saddle-built storks. Very pretty, isn't it, that male? And hopefully he flies back, but for now I think he's gone off maybe to go and call his wife and say the kids are misbehaving. It's your turn to look after them. Okay, well, we're going to move off, see what else it is that we can find. But David, on the other side in the marsh, has found something hiding in the bushes. Boys and girls, now welcome to something different. And we got a rhino or a rhinoceros for you. And look at that. Come out, please. Pop up your head. The kids of Nat Geo want to see your face. Please come out. Very good. A little bit better. At least we can see your ears and part of your body. So, boys and girls, this is a rhinoceros or a rhino. And we got two types of rhinos in Africa. One is called the black rhino and the other one is called the white rhino. And when I talk of black and white, it's not because of the color. It's because of the shape of the mouth. And I will demonstrate to you what I'm talking about. Now, the difference between the two is the same as much as I'm talking about black or white. The difference will be on the mouth. Now, the black rhino have a, a triangular shaped like mouth, like that. All right? That's a black rhino, and that's what we have for you now. A white rhino has like a square-like or a rectangular shaped mouth because they feed differently. Now we'll go back to the rhino and see if we might be lucky to see her bring her head out. But even if she doesn't, at least now we can tell the difference between black and white rhinos. It's not in the color, it is in the shape of their mouth. Now, the black rhinos, like what we have there, they only tend to eat like giraffes. You remember earlier, I was talking about giraffes eating leaves, small twigs, small branches. That's exactly what the black rhinos will eat. And the shape of the mouth helps them to grasp or to hold. Did you see the two horns on it? The leaves and twigs to pull to the mouth. White rhinos will only eat grass. 
And another important difference between the two, the black rhino is a bit shy, and because it tends to eat leaves and small branches like that, they tend to remain in the bushes, while the white rhino will be out eating grass. Those are the two differences between the two. So many people have always thought, oh, black rhino is black, white rhino is white. Not really. The difference will be on the mouth. Another important difference between the black and the white, the black rhinos tend to be solitary. They tend to move alone. But when we look at the white rhinos, you always see them going in twos, threes or fours. We're going to wait here a few more minutes and see if she's coming out and you can see she's trying to turn her head. And let's go back to James and find out what his leopard is doing. And here we are with our leopard. And what she's done is moved off into the shade. Now, you can tell she's quite old. If you look at her tooth, at the left canine, there we are. Can you see the canine there? See how blunt it is? That only happens on a cat that's very old. Well, quite old, shall we say. She's not very old, but she is old. And that's from years and years of biting things and crunching and basically eating too many bones with those teeth, I suppose, you could say. Hello, dancers with dirt. Uh, leopards deal with pain in much the same way that every other animal has to out here. They don't really have a choice. They just have to kind of deal with it. I think because they realize that there's nothing they can do about it, they don't tend to think too much of about it, you know. Uh, obviously, pain has a function, and what pain's function is in all bodies is that it stops movement. So basically what happens is that if your leg is very sore, it starts to swell, or perhaps, maybe it depends what's wrong with it, of course, but the body makes it sore so that you don't move around on that leg, so that it can heal, so that it has time to heal. And that's basically what's happening here. And I think you'll find by this stage, it's 10 days old now, 10 or 12 days old, this injury, I think you'll find that she's okay. It's probably not that sore. You know, like when you get an injury, when you get sore, when you get a cut or a graze or something like that, it hurts like, well, it just hurts really badly for the first hour or so. And then it just gets a little bit less. I imagine that this injury probably hurt her for a, a two or three days, but then she probably got used to it. And if you saw her walk, you saw her walk a little bit, you saw she wasn't limping at all, so she wasn't showing signs of pain. So I think she's okay. Barbara, I'm not sure that she's lying. Well, she is actually lying on her wound. I don't think they always do it. Uh, she's certainly lying on her wound, probably to get rid of the flies, maybe, that are bugging her. The flies will irritate the wound, and if she's lying on the wound, well, then the flies don't get to it. And, you know, I know it might seem like the sand and the dirt out here can't be good for a cut or a, a wound, it's probably not bad for it. It's probably better for it than a whole lot of flies and things sitting all over it. And she'll probably clean it off at night with her tongue. She'll clean it. And so the irritation of having the flies on the wound probably just made her decide to lie like this. She looks like she's on the hunt for something. It is very hot, of course, but when she walked in here, she was certainly looking. And she's panting like that, of course, because she's very hot, just like those elephants we saw. Oh, this is very exciting. David's animal, very special animal indeed, seems to have come out from behind its bush.
Boys and girls, I told you I'm not going anywhere. I'll wait here until this rhino gives us a good fishy look. And see there, she just put her head up and you can see she got two horns. One is much longer than the other. Oops, she just put it down. And the other one is a little taller or longer than the other. Now, if you saw carefully, she was moving her ears left and right. And boys and girls, you know, we got all five senses, hearing, smell, sight. For the black rhinos, they have very good hearing sense. Their hearing is very good. They do not see very well, but they can pick up any slight movement in the thicket where they live in. Look at how she's moving her ears, left, right, up, down. And what she's exactly doing is trying to pick any slight sound and then she'd know when to move away or when to turn around. That's the other bigger difference between the black and the white trainers. The white trainers tend to see better and they will always be out in the open unlike this black one here that tend to remain either on the edge of bushes like this or right inside the bushes. And like any other mammal, they keep flicking their tails like that, just in case they got any flies that is coming on their body. And sometimes they do the same for their ears. Boys and girls, remember to keep asking us any questions through your parents or guardians using nudgeokids at worldart.tv. Should you have a nice comment, like saying, wow, we have seen. Look carefully on the shape of the mouth and you'll see what I was talking about before. It takes the shape of a triangle and it's like a lip and that triangular shaped mouth they use it to catch or to grasp leaves or twigs to feed on. Are you coming to say hello to the kids much closer to the screen? Hello! And you can see she's trying either to sniff or smell something. You notice how she blends in very well with the bushes or thickets there. Rhinos do not have as many enemies like other animals because they are big and they are very strong. But occasionally we see cats like lions trying to get their babies. But the mothers will always come out and defend their babies just like how your mothers and fathers would protect all of you. She keeps moving back and forth and hoping she'll come out and we shall have a better view. There she goes. So as she moves there, she's not eating any grass. She'll pick a plant, just chew it and swallow and then move on. Look at the ears and see how dark or black they are on the inside. And she turns one left, right, just like a radar to pick sound. Because, as I said, their hearing is very acute. You'd imagine in the bushes there, they could not be seen very well, even 10 meters away from where they are, because it's all thickets and bushes. So what they need to do more is to hear better than anything else. Come on, try not keep coming. The kids want to see you better. In Africa, kids, we got animals that we call the big five. I am not sure James might have mentioned to you, but the big five are elephants, buffaloes, rhinos, and leopards, not forgetting the lions. And I'll tell you today, you're the luckiest kids because of the big five, I guess you have seen the big four. So what you have to do is to give me James and Steve a lot of pressure to see whether we can get you the lions and all of you will have a great weekend of having completed the big five of Africa. Stop being shy, come forward and that's very normal behavior for rhinos. If it was a white rhino it would be out grazing and they're never shy and they're never scared of vehicles they'll be out just doing the thing grazing grazing but the black ones are always a bit secretive and a bit shy too unless someone 
would have come and you know stopped and looked very carefully there she also blends in very well with the tree in the background there there's something that's trying to make it a bit skittish why are the giraffes not in the big five I'll tell you how they ended up did it lay down there how they ended up naming the five animals the big five I would say it's not because of size it is because of how aggressive or let me say of how dangerous they were and they still are so giraffe is not as aggressive I would say like you know uh, a rhino or like a lion or like a buffalo or like a, you know a, a leopard giraffe if you see giraffes like what we were watching before and I come out of the car in general they're going to move away but a rhino if you come out or a buffalo or the big five as I told you they might slightly bit come straight to me that's why giraffe is not one of the big five okay I think she laid down we just have to move but before we move I want to show you we have a huge wall of rain in front of us Do you see, that? see that big wall of rain that's the direction shall be going and hopefully we might see some lions in that area but in the meantime let's go back to South Africa to see the leopard with the gems I'm afraid our leopard has not moved but we're going to stay here because we like leopards very much and we're going to hope that she does something other than just lie here eventually and she may well she might decide to go hunting she might just decide to go to sleep that's quite likely as well leopards like to sleep you can see she's just panting and panting away in the hot afternoon I don't think we're expecting any rain this side of the world I can see a little bit of cloud build up towards the southwest over the mountains but so often the clouds do build up on hot afternoons like this and then they go away without giving us any it's less and less the case as we move towards December time when then we'd expect to have a bit more rain than we've had so far so we'll just hope that that cloud eventually comes this way and gives us some rain Rosemary you say you're learning so much from this drive I'm so pleased I'm just being quiet because she's seen something or heard something and she's back to normal got brilliant ears brilliant noses and of course superb eyes and so they're able to see smell and hear really well and just I tell you what I think she was listening to she there's, there's an Egyptian goose making a bit of an alarm calling noise that's it goes a bit like this quack 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 over at the water hole and I think she was probably looking that way thinking to herself I wonder if there's another predator over there now we know that Tingana one of our big male leopards from here is not around here we know that he's further north of where we are now and so if there is another predator there I'm not sure who it would be but see how she's relaxed I'm sure that it isn't another predator she's not sleeping very soundly she's not got her head down with her eyes shut so she's resting but she's certainly not sleeping every so often her eyes sort of close but then they open again no pachyderm leopards will avoid conflicts with lions at all costs a female leopard like this weighs about one third of what a big lioness weighs and so for her to get into a fight or a conflict with a lion would mean certain death there we go and this is fairly typical <laughs> we'll just see if she turns around I don't want to disturb her too much because she's very clearly listening and smelling and looking around the place and a male lion of course weighs about whew, six or seven times what she does and so there's no ways that she would ever take on a male lion and a male leopard still even the biggest male leopards are much smaller than adult female lions and so they will not try and fight with lions they do have conflict from time to time the lions almost always win and it almost always results in death for the leopard 
So you'll find leopards, one of the reasons they're coloured like that and able to move like they are, is that it helps them to avoid any other predators. And lions would be one of the predators that could easily kill them. And quite interestingly, they don't eat leopards. I mean, it's possible that if a lion killed a leopard, it might eat it, but it's, it would be unusual. Quite often they'll just leave the kill. And so they don't kill leopards for food. We think they do it for competition. Looks like she's going to have a little bit of a clean. My only problem with moving here is that I really don't know that in all of this thick bush if we'll get a better view than we have right now. So let's just wait a second. We might get one from the other side. We could try that. While we wait and see, I don't want to move just yet. I'm just going to say to you that, of course, she has got a cub and her cub is now just over a year old and we think actually that maybe the cub has already gone into independent. Anyway, I'll tell you a bit more about that when I see you next. We're going back up to the Masai Mara now. I think we're going to go and spend some time with Steve of the Volve Falcon Bridge. Welcome back. How marvelous that is. David's able to show you black rhino and you're able to see Tundi. I've been trying in this open area to see if we can come across a lion for you to try and add one more to the big five that you've already seen. The elephant, the leopard, the rhino, the black rhino. Have you seen a buffalo? I don't think you've seen buffalo. And then of course, the next one on the list would be the lion. So this is a nice area to find lions in. We are looking and scanning, see what we can find. You never know. It could be anything around the corner, behind any of the bushes. It's not, not as hot up here as it is down in South Africa. So Tundi, you see, is sleeping under the bush because it's just too hot to do anything else. We're here. It's much cooler. There is a chance that lions could be moving around. They do spend most of their time sleeping under trees, though, I'll be honest with you. But because the Mara, we're quite sort of in the middle of the continent, close to the equator, and quite high up. So the temperature here is not that bad. Not that hot, I mean. I'm sure James is sweating in his seat there, and Tundi's sitting in the shade, panting, trying to cool off. I'm sure she wishes, wishes she could just go for a swim in the swimming pool. But there are still a few moments. We might be lucky. Everybody holding thumbs for a lion in the last moments of the drive. I hope so. Or oh, anything, really. Lovely just to be out here. The fresh air, the wide open expanses are really good for the soul. Okay, well, we're scanning, scanning. And on the other side of the marsh, we come. Katie, you want to know which country in Africa is the hottest? I don't know. Sudan, perhaps? Most likely the deserted countries, where there's no trees and the sun bakes down on the on the continent but I'm not 100% sure um, it does get quite hot in the sort of the central parts of the country of the continent due to the equator and the sun being sort of straight on and straight above but then also the desert areas get the coldest as well because there's no vegetation or anything to hold sort of the heat in but that's a good question we're quite high here. We're about 1,900 meters. So that is high. So that makes it uh, a little bit cooler. I think for every 100 meters, it's about, or well, 1,000 meters, about six degrees colder as you go higher. That's why Juma is so much, so much warmer because they're so much closer to sea level. The sun baking down on them. Have I taken the wrong road here, James? 
I've never been on this road before. Never been on this road before, but what a marvelous afternoon. Thank you for joining us. We got to see black rhino, leopards, giraffe and elephants, the wide open expanses of the Maasai Mara. I hope we will see you again next week on the Saturday show, which we are doing every single Saturday for the Nat Geo Kids. You should all be keeping lists for all the animals that you're seeing on the weeks coming and see if you can start identifying the birds as you go and the mammals and see if you can get any new ones because there's going to be lots and lots and lots of animals over the coming months that you're going to see and we have seasonal change between sort of uh, winter and summer here and down in Juma. But thank you for joining us. It has been a wonderful afternoon here for the Nacho Kids. And we...